so there's the camera. We're good there. We're good on audio, and we are completely live. Look at that. Yeah. Chem Labs tonight. Now, wait. Am I not supposed to curse and stuff? It's a podcast. Okay, fuck it. Exactly. Fuck it. Uh, We're in front of Metro. Lovely night. Lovely night for cold waves. Yeah. Um, Chem Lab, uh, 10 o'clock tonight? Yep. 10 o'clock, baby. So, rock and roll. If you're watching this live uh, on Facebook, there's still time to head over here. I mean, this is... I, this is one of the greatest events the city has to offer, and it's for a good cause. It is. For the right reasons. It is. Yep. Hey. One of my oldest friends. A great Jamie? guy. Oh, yeah. He used to come out and do sound with us. He played with us on stage. I'm the guy that released the first couple of Acumen records. I used to run Fifth Column Records. That's right, of course. Because yeah, Chem Lab was on this label. Mm-hmm. The guy wanted to, he had some money. It was like he ran a club across the street for the 930 Club in D.C. where I used to work. He's like, I want to sign you. Sign me to what? To a nightclub? I don't think so. <laughs> like, how about this? You give me access to your paycheck, and I'll put together a promo plan, and we'll record the record, which is why we got to go and record at Chicago Tracks and all of that. And then I figured, well, you know, to have some leverage with the record label, uh, with uh, the distributors, so that they would pay us, I had to give them new products. So, well, let's start, you know, signing other bands. So, yeah, we released the first couple of Acumen records. We toured together a bunch, and Jamie was great. He would come, and he'd do sound for us, and he'd, he'd you know, he'd get the board rocking for about two songs, three songs. And he'd turn to the LD, to the lighting director, and he'd say, just uh, watch the board for a minute. And the lighting director's like, dude, I'm not a sound man. What do you want from me? I can't do this shit. It's like, no, 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 it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. I got it all set up. I'm a pro. And then he'd run through the crowd, jump up on stage, grab his Flying V guitar, and come and rock out with us for a couple That's of amazing. songs. Which is fantastic. And he'd hear the mix slowly drifting off of calm and be like okay I gotta I gotta go I gotta go and then he'd run back to the board and fix it again it was great that's yeah, a true so multitasker I, I loved Jamie and I, I should I should do a quick reset because for yes. those who may be listening to the podcast or watching the video and don't know what the fuck is going they on they don't know what the fuck is going on so Cold Waves this is the eighth year yep. of Cold Waves uh, this festival this, this three day event was born out of the need to raise awareness for Particularly the people who work in nightclubs and yep. those kind of late yep. night situations, musicians yep. certainly, uh, and how it can get pretty dark. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's really challenging. It was to celebrate Jamie's life that mm-hmm. first year, and because we keep the dead alive by telling stories about them, and so it was this. I've heard that before. Huge I like event. the way that sounds. Well, it's you know, and that's what I do. I carry a lot of stories with me. Um, both about people who are gone and uh, a whole bunch of other stuff like life, you know, because mm-hmm. it's full of stories. So it was to memorialize him, to remember him, to keep him alive, and then Darkest Before Dawn became this huge charity that grew out of this and all the work that uh, Jason and Kelly do and the whole Cold Ways family to provide support and occasionally a little bit of money for people who work at night, you know. It's hard. Bartenders, door staff, sound people. And yeah, it's incredibly hard. I did it for almost ten years. It was... I worked in the restaurant industry for a few years, and when I was much younger. But there was a certain unreality to mm-hmm. working those hours. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. You're going home to bed as everyone's in the morning grind. Right, because you, know? you, you work your double shift, and then you go out. Yeah. Then you get yeah. home at five a.m. and it, it is a bit of, I, I guess, to say it again, unreality mm-hmm. to that world. So it is. This is a, a terrific, a terrific. I am fucking fantastic. <laughs> I'm hosting a 1950s talk show. This is a terrific it's event. It's neat, It is. Really keen. Uh, but this is a terrific event. And I'm gonna, I, I know I'm going to use this word a lot tonight as I talk to artists playing. I use it with Papa Lead itself. But the word community certainly mm-hmm. comes to mind when talking about this event. Yep. And certainly long before Cold Waves, when I think about the industrial music yep. world, it's a community. Yep, it is indeed. And Chicago has been this sizzling, crackling hub of it for decades and that's why we wanted to come here and record the first album. Then we did the remixes here, and then we did the second album here, and we did the third album here. You know, we were recording at Chicago Tracks because that's where the Revolting Cox came out, and Ministry came out, and all this fantastic stuff. Mm-hmm. And to me, community is crucial. We are stronger as a tribe, and we share strengths and support each other in weaknesses. And Chicago... I never actually lived here, lived here. 
but it, this it felt of, like I have, and it I feels know. like home. It's always like homecoming. Like tonight's this huge homecoming night. Uh, Jimmy Marcus from D Warsaw once called me the mayor of, of Chicago, and I was just, I was so touched and humbled by that. Especially because he's the mayor of Chicago, which is right. Weird. I know it was hubris. Like yes, I am. No, I'm actually not anything of the sort. But that's what I was going to say. I, I'm not mistaken in thinking that Chicago is a special place for you oh, slash yeah. Chemlab. Oh yeah. No, it's home. It is. And I love being here. And we just... And it's... At the first Cold Waves, um, I was working on a new project called Prude. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the guitarist came with me, and we had toured a couple of years before. Uh, this guy, Mark Plastic, who's this phenomenal guitarist. And... So we had a million guitarists on stage. I tried, I had, I think, 11 guitarists on stage. And uh, and it was wonderful to just be there to honor Jamie. And right before the last song, I said, thank you so much for coming out. It's been really fantastic. This is our last song. This is our last song ever because I'm breaking up the band right here, mm -hmm. right now. And everyone went from just, you know, joyous to elegiac in the snap of a finger. So. We were we were dead for six years, and Jason, who created that, that was your Ziggy Stardust moment. That was yeah. That was Boris yep. saying, "Not only is this the last song, this it is was. the last song we'll ever do." It was, it was. Except I went back on my word. <laughs> yes, you did. And Jason, who created the whole Cold Waves Festival mm -hmm. with his wife and Darkest Before Dawn, then mm -hmm. pestered me and pestered me and pestered me and said, "Is this breaking up shit really for real? Come on!" And so finally, last year, I said, uh, "Yeah, all right, I'll you know I'll come and play and." to be suffused with the love and support and interest after six years of not playing was mind-boggling and well, these really songs humbling. are so inextricably part of who you are, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, walking away from that seems a little weird. Yeah, I'm a weird guy. You know? Fair enough. I wanted to do other things and I felt like an old man in the way. Mm -hmm. And that's never interested me. So I wanted to go off and do different stuff, and and the reason that it came back alive and is so alive now is because the guys that I'm making music with, who are actually now part of the band, and are, have revitalized it in really crucial, elemental ways, um, Dan Evans and Vince McCallie and Mikey Love, who've played in bands around here in Chicago for years, they're in a band called Dead on TV, and then mm -hmm. they were supporting Jimmy Marcus uh, in his band Go Fight. Mm -hmm. and. And I saw them at that first Cold Waves. It's like, oh, they're really good. They're really good. But I'm not doing any music anymore with the guys and so on. Yeah. But I stayed in touch with Dan. So Jason said, will you come and play last year? And I said, yes, but there's a caveat. I have to, I have to go and talk to someone first. So I went and talked to Dan. And I said, would you guys, we've never played together. We've hardly ever spoken. You've just been making eyes with them. Yeah, I was. I was oogling them lasciviously and, and and I said would you do this and he said oh yeah that'd be really fun because we've been listening to you since high school oh my god and they are so good they are the band that has made it come alive again but isn't that important eh? because you've been around this genre this scene for as long as you have it is important to have new ideas mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Industrial music needs to evolve yep. and change yep. and yep. grow and become something new for a new generation. Otherwise, yep. we're all just going to go back to the same Wax Tracks albums we grew up. Oh with. yeah, oh yeah, and it's got to be it's got to be new and interesting and engaging and be willing to take chances and it's got to laugh at itself. It's got to be self-deprecating and not take itself too seriously. It's so one of the things that I always loved about Al and Paul was they were willing to just you know laugh at themselves and laugh at the world around them. And I think that that's crucially important. Rock and roll when it takes itself too seriously it works from the shoulders up and it can't for it to be effective it's got to hit you in the gut and go from the hips mm -hmm. down it's got to be sex it's got to be sleazy and laughable and it's got to laugh at itself as well as, as the rest said, of the sleazy, world I, I saw a sign for my life with the thrill kill cult the uh <laughs> one, one yes. of their eps so i mean that they're Speaking of sleaze, like synchronicitous, uh -huh. synchronicitous. Mm -hmm. So, and boy, those three boys, whew, I'm, I'm forever grateful because they they just, kind of snap you back. Oh yeah, oh hugely, hugely. And in Chicago, after having played a week of dates uh, before this show last year, I said in the middle of the show, "All right, all right, God damn it, I, I guess I'm back." And the house just went nuts, and it just felt so good. And and playing with them gets me excited about it again. 
playing songs that I've played for 30 years yeah. and I'm excited about that you know they gotta be really special musicians and they are well yeah. let, let's go back a while let's go back to the Burnout Out album like <laughs> that's way back that's way back for you kids that don't know that was done before they invented fucking electricity that's right that's way uh, back I got my copy delivered by horse yes that's how long yes, ago that's right yeah. uh, and then we went to Pigeons yeah <laughs> so I mean that was early 90s mm-hmm fascinating time for music and I, I tend to go back to talking about this because it was this sea change in yeah. pop culture yep tell me what it was what it was like for Kemlap back around that era it was exciting it was thrilling there were a whole host of bands that were starting to come together you know 16 volt were doing stuff acumen were doing stuff and a bunch of bands like you know ministry and puppy mm-hmm. and the Cox and that was almost beginning to feel like old guard and we were this whole next wave of stuff and it wasn't industrial uh, you know because industrial to me to call us industrial it's a misnomer I mean that to me is throbbing gristle it's SPK mm-hmm. it's you know uh, and so and I started calling it machine rock and that's a term that, 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 says, that covers a, yeah because um, it is and people ask me oh what kind of music do you play and I just say rock and roll because it's easy and then they're like oh really rock and roll like well if you really want to know it's it's rock and roll made by broken robots who like fighting and fucking and then they look at me like uh okay I, so rock and roll right yeah, yeah. I, sold by the way that's the elevator yeah. pitch but that was it was a really exciting time there's a lot of stuff going on and records were just appearing like mad out of nowhere and all these cool little labels were appearing reconstriction and yeah. cargo and like what the fuck is all of this <laughs> and so and we just we toured and toured and toured and toured we took the old Jay Giles approach to touring the way you used to do it in the 70s and in fact you sounded a lot like Jay Giles oh very much yeah. so that's I'm you know I'm, I'm wearing got, my, my Peter Wolf shirt <laughs> yes. right actually no this is my this is my cheap trick dream police there you go tonight. way to keep it Midwest yep yeah. and you know well, look oh look at that look at those shoes yeah, baby. Those are badass. Things are awesome. And I think that's, that's comfortable what, as a motherfucker, too. That looks like what uh, Cousin Eddie was wearing in the first National Lampoon Vacation movie. Yeah. Let's see. They have a joint. Uh-huh. So, but I have a pair of black and white checked ones that I was thinking of wearing on stage, but I haven't tested them out on stage yet, and if they're slippery, I'm screwed. By the way, Kim Lip can totally put shoes up on the furniture. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Mom. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> It's totally fine. So, but yeah, it was a great time. It was a great time. And we became friends with all these bands because we would just play together. It's like, who are you? Oh, you know, we're Halo Black. Like, okay, cool. That's great. Let's play. Like, okay, cool. You know? and back in the 90s, you, you thought running a label's got to be easy. Right. Uh, what an idiot I was. <laughs> what Jesus. a piece of cake that'll, that'll be. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I got this guy who's got some money and I'm building a structure for mm-hmm. it. So let's fucking release some records and I only release stuff that I was completely in love with which you should if you're starting a late I mean, oh yeah oh yeah it's gotta be it's gotta be a work of passion um, and I'm lucky that I'm still friends with most of those people Jason and I definitely had a couple of years where it was adversarial was a, a friendly <laughs> term for it um, but you know we all we grow and we let a bunch of the wounds be solved and move on but it was fun while it lasted I put out 44 records which is pretty cool uh, that's a stunning number a really broad selection of stuff from just uh, fantastic machine rock stuff like Death Ride 69 nobody knows that record this record's called Screaming Down the Gravity Well and it's just so good. And I felt like, yeah, that's the record that's going to turn everything around. That's and the one. And then all of a sudden, Final Cut put out a record with us, and that was so good, too. Like, yes, this thing is really going to go. And we hit the wall, and then, you know, my fucking huge, huge-ass drug habit took over everything and consumed my life. Let, let's talk that. about that, if that's okay. Oh, fuck, yeah, sure. Uh, it's been, I... I not my style to talk about this kind of thing and, and put artists on the spot, but this is Cold Waves, and we're talking about people who turn to drugs, who turn yep. to booze yep. late at night. You are sober. Oh, I am. Yeah. 20 years? 20, 20 years. As my, my little coined term goes, 20 years, no smack, no crack, no pills, no powders, no booze, no reefer, no cigarettes, Did you do all no those? Jesus. No Jesus. I mean, did you do smack and crack and all this? Oh, yeah. I died twice. You have those stories where you're basically coding on a table? Yeah. Yeah, they shocked me awake. Yep, in Minneapolis. And then in New York, years later. Yeah, yeah. So is yep. I was fucked up. What turned fucked you up. what turned you around? Were, were those It was time. 
Neither of the times that I died actually did anything but make me realize, yeah, I'm alive, let's go celebrate and party. And I did. Wow. Because, well, fuck it, I was, you know, I was a dope fiend. Who gives a shit? I'm alive. That means I get to go and get high. And not only do I get to, I need to. Right. You know, you don't get high anymore. It's why they used to call it in the 50s, the beat generation range. They call it getting straight. Because you weren't getting high. You were just getting back on the beam again. So right. that you could be like other people. Um, yeah, no, I was a complete and utter fuck up. And one of the worst, worst things about it was that I had this terrible capacity to make it look good. And you're, I was you're high a functioning, functioning addict, yeah. I was releasing records. I was in this band that was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I had a record label going, uh, you know, um, influential in some sort of way, what the fuck ever that means. And I, I appreciate your self deprecation, but. Uh, yeah. But people looked at me and thought, well, that's cool. I can do that too. No, you can't. And I couldn't either. And there are people like the guy that helped me start the label who, you know, he's dead now. He's dead now because of me. Yes, we're all adults and blah, blah, blah. But I could see what was coming. Uh, you know, we were up in New York. I was living there. But the guys came up from D.C. and for CMJ, the yeah. music conference sure. back in the 80s. And uh, all staying at a hotel in New York. And we were out cruising around town in a limo. And it was me and my first wife, who actually I have a really good relationship with still. Uh, and Craig. And we went and scored. And... Uh, and we dropped him off at the hotel I and mean, we got high in the back of the limo. We were just chasing the dragon. We weren't shooting up because that had moved out of that period for a while. For a while. And, uh, and we let him off at the hotel and said, You didn't get a spike, did you? You, didn't, you know, you're not going to shoot this up. You're just going to chase it off a tinfoil, right? Or snort it or whatever. You know, put it on your dick. I don't care. Mm -hmm. Just don't. He was like, Yeah, no, no, no. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. And I came to the hotel at 7 in the morning to wake them all up and get them ready to go. And, you know, we've got conferences and blah, blah, blah. And we were going to be performing. And, and I got into the room and uh, one of the guys was in the bed and Craig's bed wasn't slept in. So the light was on in the bathroom. I was like, oh, he's probably in there. And the door was locked. And I knocked and knocked and knocked and knocked and knocked. And finally had to break the door down. And he was there just crumpled up in a little pile did, did you know right then and there? Yep. Oh, of course. He didn't get the spike out of his arm, uh, which is good because it was fast. He was an only child. I had to call his folks in Germany. I had to arrange plane flights. I had to get a funeral home. I had to work all that. I had to get them a hotel. And they were crushed, and they looked at me like I was something really special. You know, I had helped him out. We were working this record label together, and, and I just felt like such a sham. Yeah. This is my fault. So I carry him around with me all the time. I have a ring that uh, we shared, and uh, so I wear it all the time to just keep him alive, because you keep people alive by telling stories about him. He was a great guy. He was a fascinating and bizarre and hilarious character. Um, but So I've spent 20 years trying to just be as honest about that stuff as yeah. possible and well, it's uh, help important. people out. Yeah. You know? Especially at an event like this, it's important. Yeah. You walk that path. Oh, yeah. You are really yeah. fucking lucky to be here. I've, yeah, no kidding. No kidding. I is really it, am. Is it hard to connect with music that you created when you were in that state? Do you recognize the person who wrote those songs? Um, oh, sure. Because he's still in there. Oh, yeah. And it's not like I'm a different guy. I'm just a guy who has better control over that guy. That guy gets to come out on stage. Right. And being on stage, especially with this band now, Dan and Mike and Vince, uh, there, it's so good that it gets me so fucking high. And I never knew that that was what I was actually searching for, doing all the drugs. That high on stage fucks me up. That's awesome. Oh my god! And I'm just, I'm, I'm gone. And there are times when I completely disassociate. I don't remember where I've been for the past ten minutes. Um, and so that guy gets to come out, but he's not drug and booze fueled anymore. Yeah. He's fueled by rock and roll and art, um, because that guy can't. He's not the guy that takes my kid to school. Right. He's not the guy that goes and shops. He's not the guy that you know tries to 
hold life together. He's not the guy who's a good husband. Believe me. I love you, baby. Thank you for 20 years of sticking with my insane, fucked up ass. He, when he rules, rules the show, everything is fucked up and everything yeah. goes off the rails. But just because he doesn't rule the roost doesn't mean he isn't in there. Makes sense. He's there. So, yeah, I recognize him. Definitely. I wrestle with him a bunch. You know, he's a powerful motherfucker. He's a powerful motherfucker. Sure. So, yeah, no, I get it. I see him. I connect with him. You know, he's pissed off he doesn't get to play more. <laughs> but he <laughs> plays hard on stage because he knows he's got 45 minutes or an hour. That's he's his like, oh. God, I got to use this now. So the beast comes fucking out. And that's hey, okay. This is good perspective, I think. Um, see, I, I, I can't see when people or who's sending messages. Someone says, "Please say hello to hello for me." So hello, hello. I, I don't know. I don't How know are just you? Said that. I don't know who said it, but thank you for listening. And this guy is a blast, and this is loads of fun. And we're in a car in front I, of Metro, which is just surreal. Are. The Cubs and Cards are playing like a block away. Yeah, they are big rivalry. Big yes, rivalry. The honorary Chicago one. Um, oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know, it, well, and I a, coach my son's baseball team. There too, it is. So, you know, uh, talking about darkness and music, etc. The covers that you chose to do a couple years ago on album, these are all darkish kind, kind of songs. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Sister Midnight. Yeah. That, that Roxy Music song is. In Every Dream, Home of Heartache. <laughs> yeah, with music by Jim Coleman, who, you know, performed. He was in, he started Cop Shoot Cop. And then uh, he's been with Swans for years. Yeah, you know. But I mean, they're all, like the records that I released on Fifth Column, yeah. they're all songs that have been really important to me. Except the Air song, I just wanted to fuck it up. Sexy Boy. it's so pretty, yeah. you know, and I wanted to just make a messy, massive shit out of it, which we did. Jason McNinch, who's now also gone, who's a huge uh, Chicago character, he played a lot of the guitar on that record, and so it's a nice way to keep him going, too. All right, so looking past tonight, and again, 10 o'clock for ChemLab if you're yep. watching this. And i got to uh, go and put on my lacy bow undergarments pretty soon. Yeah, I, I realize I'm underdressed. I should be wearing like a, a dog collar and a ball Dude, gag tonight. Whatever works. Whatever Some, works. Something vinyl. Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> I won't have any vinyl on. I sweat enough as it is. There it is. Jesus. Uh, all right, so after tonight, after you played tonight at Cold Waves, you've got this band. You're reinvigorated. Where Where's ChemLab headed next? Uh... Not necessarily on tour, but like spiritually yeah. or albums. Yeah. And um, I'm releasing records now with a great old friend of mine in England. He started a label years ago called Armalite Industries, and he puts out Pig and Cubanate and C-Tech and a whole host of other really cool mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, Joy Thieves from Chicago. Mm -hmm. We'll be hearing a lot about them. Uh, th there are like 20 people in that band. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yep, yep. Good luck. Uh -huh. Good luck. Boy, that's tough at the airport. Uh -huh. um, but uh, So we're going to re-release Burnout in April. We're oh, going to wow. do it on vinyl for the first time You, you buried ever. the lead on that one as yeah, we're talking about. Yeah, well, it. you know. Okay. Um, yeah, so we're going to put it out on vinyl, and then there will be a CD version that's the original record, and then another disc of cassette demo tapes that nobody's awesome. ever heard before, some of which I'm selling tonight. That's awesome. Um, and then in June, we'll do Eastside Militia on vinyl, uh, which is impossible to find, and Burnout was never on vinyl. And then we'll do a CD with outtakes and cassette stuff, uh, and then I'll be working on, with these guys, uh, new music. Awesome. So You're busy. We'll, yeah, fuck yeah. Because they've completely revitalized the old goat. So I'm like, man, let's make music. Um, yeah, I'm coming out from under the bridge. So I'm not dead yet. So, Thank God yeah. for that. Yeah, it's Glad pretty cool. Here. It's pretty cool. I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to be here and thrilled that people actually care, that they're interested and willing to come and see shows and buy merch and, you know, my weird limited edition books and stuff. And it's just, it's, uh, it's kind of humbling. We've come for the machine rock. Hey, man, I will deliver. I will All right. deliver. Thank you for doing this. Tonight at Metro, it's Cold Waves Night Number One Cam Lab. Thank you for watching. Uh, thank you for listening. Carco and Carney, presented by the Audubon Mazda of Evanston. This is where I make the video go away. Yeah.